that, of course. She speaks Italian. I'm the Holocaust. And now she's the Shabbat. Okay. You can turn to page 482. Or page 482. And Until she goes back to Torah. This is our last uh, official class of the season. There's no class next week. We hope to have one after Purim, but you're going to have to be in touch through email. So things are not uh, set up. scheduled or set up uh, for, for, for technical reasons. We can't do that at this point, but we will keep you posted. We hope we'll have, we'll have one that relates to Pesa. But for now, we're going to enter it a little bit into the Purim, uh, the Purim season. Okay, now... A part of our Jewish experience is to tune in to the great Torah on a weekly basis. on the sometimes you hear them. And there are different styles that and clearly what talks to one person will not talk to another. Uh, there are those that uh, enjoy or uh, perhaps find meaning by linking events that are taking place during a specific week to the Parsha. Uh, so we, we in general here what we do is we focus more on understanding the text itself, the Parsha itself, the message of what's being uh, taught to us. Uh, but there are times that we perhaps do link other events uh, to the Parsha, in other words, the cycle we are familiar with, uh, that we read every single week, a Parsha at times two, when we complete it by Simchat Torah. Uh, this is recent. When I say recent, it's perhaps 17, 1800 years old, right? For us Jews, that's like yesterday. Now, to go ahead and, and find meaning with the fact that a specific Parsha is read at a specific week, uh, some view it as a stretch because it doesn't date back to Sinai. Others, and I would say the majority of our nation, say the following. If Klal Israel, if the people of Israel for so many centuries have been reading a specific portion and it always falls during a specific time in the calendar, it's not random and we have every right to go ahead and link the two and find some kind of insight. Okay. And the classic example of where there's a level of acceptance of this idea occurs in this week's uh, Parsha. We're going to be reading Parashat Tetzaveh. And the name of Moshe Rabbeinu, which appears in every single parasha till the end of the book of Amidbar. And remember, it is God Almighty talking to him. right? And the words, by the Ber Hashem al Moshe Lemor, are found throughout the Torah. And here in this week's parsha, it does not appear. Not the end of the world, we could deal with it. But you want to find a little bit of meaning. So different insights are, are presented as to why he is not mentioned. So there's a classic explanation mentioned by Rabbi Yaakov Balhaturim in the early 14th century. And he tells us the following. Uh, you know, when God Almighty is communicating with Moshe the first time, Moshe says to him, you want me to lead the Jewish people? Ben Meshuggah, you know, you know what it involves. You know, they're not the easiest group. And God Almighty pushes him and says, listen, you have a role, you have a mission. And he responds, you know what? There's someone that's been doing it so well up until now. My brother, my older brother. So shlach na biyati shlach, why not send him as a messenger? He's doing a good job and I could sit and meditate and deal with the flock, it's much, much easier, right? Dealing with sheep than with people, right? And, you know, you have people that prefer, you know, dealing with the pet than with the child, right? You don't have to worry about Jewish education. You don't have to worry about chutzpah. You don't have to worry about shidduchim. There's so many things that the pet, so Moshe Rabbeinu feels, here I am, I'm taking care of a flock. It's a spiritual experience, there's no question in my mind. Uh, you relate to nature, and you figure out that there's a higher being, and you can think about the higher being. And meditating is, is really a way of connecting. Involvement with people, and with all due respect, the Jewish people, it's not an easy task. You cannot meditate one second when you're interacting. Maish Rabbeinu was not ready for it. Shlachna, let Aaron do it. 
And the Almighty says to him, you know what? This is how it's presented at least, according to our tradition. If, you, if you're not doing it willingly, okay, I'm not going to give you the whole package deal. I'll keep Aaron and his children as the priests. You will be the one to bring the Torah, because the fact is you are a spiritual being, but when it comes to the kehuna, to the priesthood, that's his, not yours, due to your attitude. Now, obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's very, very interesting, the whole relationship that uh, Moshe has. He's always arguing with God, right? And it seems to be like a couple, right? That they love one another, but they're always fighting. That's what it seems to be. But reality is that Moshe Rabbeinu symbolizes Torah. And Torah is to get the truth. And you're not going to get the truth if you agree to everything you hear, right? When a teacher, you know the story of Rabbi Yochanan, that Rabbi Yochanan would get up in the Bet Midrash, and he had his colleague slash student Rish Lakish, and anything Rabbi Yochanan would say, Rish Lakish would argue. Everything. And it would uh, it sharpen Rabbi Yochanan, and he had to develop insight, because if you have to defend your position, you have to truly understand it. When Rish Lakish dies, and a student, other students come in front of Rabbi Yochanan to take over the role, and they agreed with what the master said, he said, I don't need such students. I don't want people who agree with me. I want arguing. I want someone that there's going to be disagreement. When there's disagreement, you go ahead and it demands from you to really figure out what your position is. You get truth. Welcome to Judaism. Jews argue, right? You know, they have now uh, elections in Israel, right? And if you turn on, uh, uh, and you look on YouTube, and there are inter they are interviewing uh, four politicians, all four of them are talking the whole hour, right? And only Israelis, Israelis are very talented people, and they are able to hear four people at the same time. I don't know how. And that's, that's, that's how it works. Jews argue, right? You get on a bus in Israel, right? You share it up. Everybody's discussed. That's how we work. But the result is it sharpens us, and we become a nation that can make the contribution that we do. That is what Moshe Rabbeinu was about, okay? Now, result is, writes this Rabbi Yaakov Balaturim, the portion that focuses on the vestments and the role of Aharon HaKohen, the high priest, is the portion where we omit Moshe Rabbeinu to make that point. This is Aharon's parasha, not Moshe. That's how we understand it, fine? Now, there's an explanation that was presented centuries later by Rabbi Eliyahu of Vilna in the 18th century. And he says that you should know that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, according to tradition, on the seventh day of the month of Adar. Almost every single year, Parashat Tetzaveh is the parsha of that week. Tomorrow is the seventh of Adar. It's the yard side of Moshe Rabbeinu. So to commemorate that idea that he left, that he departed, that he's not here, Obviously, he lives on. Boy, does he live on, right? Torah Moshe has been going since for 3,400 years. But to commemorate that concept, his name does not appear here. Fine. So that's a, a, a uniqueness of, uh, of, of, this, of this parasha of what's taking place. So what we're going to try to do is once we have been told that it is acceptable to link a parasha to the times or to what is occurring uh, during this month, we're going to go ahead and bring Purim into the picture a little bit as we study this week's uh, parasha. But first, we're going to start with a series of questions, a series of questions that on the surface do not relate to one another. And we're going to have to remember the questions because then when we start addressing them, hopefully we'll have a level of clarity. Question number one. This parsha, if you read it, when you read it this Shabbat, you will realize that it is addressing in general two things vestments of the Kohanim and the high priest, okay, the stones of the high priest. Uh, you could go ahead if you're ever uh, stuck in uh, Centerpoint Mall in Steeles and Young, they have a Russian stone store. You could go ahead and you could find many of the stones. Yeah, you'll have to come with several Chumashim translations to know which stone is which, but nevertheless it is interesting to go through them and see the stones that were there for the uh, high priest's breastplate, but the vestments are section number one of this week's parasha. Then a little bit about the process of inauguration. At the end of the parasha, that's why I want you to turn to page 482, 
we are talking about another vessel that was in the tabernacle. The vessel described here is known as the golden mizbeah, the golden altar. And the dimensions are given, what it is made from is given, is presented here as well. And what it will be used for, it will be used for, in verse 7, vihiktir alav, on it, Aaron shall burn the what? The spice incense, and it shall come up in smoke. This is done every single day, early in the morning, when he goes ahead and he fixes the menorah. Okay? Now, the question that we have to ask is, this is not a garment. This is a vessel. Where do vessels belong when it comes to parshiot that describe the construction of the Mishkan, you would expect it to be in Parashat Truma. So why is this at the end of Parashat Tetzaveh? Okay, so that's question number one that we have to address to figure out what this is all about. Question number two. Now, question number two is going to go back to Vaishlach. When Yaakov has a battle with this quote-unquote angel, with some kind of force, uh, is, is it happening actually? Is it a vision? Is it a dream? These are different commentators have a different approach, but there's no question that it symbolizes something quite significant. A battle against forces that want to uproot us. There are forces in the world that want to uproot the Jewish people. Sounds crazy, right? <laughs> Reality is crazy. Reality is crazy. It's not rational. It is not rational at all, but it does exist. And we, in our tradition, we say, Bechol dor vador omdim aleinu So clearly, clearly, today, it's the role was taken over by Iran. Iran. And, you know, it's, there's a, a, a statement, the statement that Talmud makes, that the people of Israel, you know what awakens the Jewish people to turn to the Almighty? When there's an awful decree upon us. That's what awakens the Jews. This is what the Talmud tells us. That the Jews in the Persian Empire uh, were comfortable there. You know, they felt at home. They probably got along with the Shah. In other words, they, everything was going well. And when uh, leaders would turn to them and say, you know what, you have to remember your tradition, your identity, the laws that keep you alive as a nation, connection to Eretz Israel, connection to Torah, mitzvahs, kashrut, whatever it is, the Jews would say, yeah, it's a nice thing, but uh, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. And then suddenly... And then suddenly, when there's a prime minister that is a real anti-Semite, and authority was given, was given to him, the Jews awaken. And in the words of the Talmud, Gadol hasarat hatabaat, the removal of the ring, which was a sign of transfer of power, that was more effective than the words of all the prophets. Prophet could get up, and from today till tomorrow, Yirmiyo Anovi, right, with a name like Yirmiyo, he was ignored <laughs> right and left, and then suddenly, when there's a removal of the ring, uh, that worked, right? And it, it came to me a little bit on a positive side, on a positive side. The following, a couple months ago, uh, south of the border, the, the, the President uh, uh, and the United States Army got rid of Suleimani. Remember him? Yeah. Now, how in the media did they confirm that it was him when they came and they started snapping pictures around, uh, around his uh, vehicle that was destroyed? So they found there a hand, ring. and on the hand there was a ring. 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 So what I said was, Gadol hasarat hayad imatabat. In other words, <laughs> that there's something great that Almani, he was a Sona Israel. In other words, there's no question about it that this was a person that had pure, the pure Iranian, God forbid to say it about all Iranians, they're very, very uh, nice people. I, I live closer to Yagna, I've mentioned, so I'm very, I, you know, they are indeed nice people. I'll keep away from an Iranian crowd right now, but uh, at the same time, they're decent people, but there is a Sinas Yisrael, there's a hatred that is coming from there. So this is a battle that unfortunately, Yaakov Avinu was already informed that you, Yaakov, I have some news for you, right? I have good news and bad news. The good news is that you symbolize, you are going to be carrying a message that is important for humanity, and it is very important for humanity. The bad news is, is that until we fix this nutty world, 
there are going to be those who are going to want to uproot you. Okay, that was Yaakov's battle. Yaakov succeeds. He succeeds, he survives, which is really should be the root of Jewish optimism. We're going to be around. No one is getting rid of us, period. That's it. We're here. We, we somehow managed to survive uh, the destruction in Europe, and boy, did we survive with spiritual success, physical success, a clear indication that there's a God above. How is it that the Jews have the ability to rebuild? We look at Parshat Vaishlach, and we look at the Battle of Yaakov, and he survived. Now, Yaakov Avinu, as he is ending this uh, confrontation, he turns to the angel and he sa asks him a question. What's his question? Not Jewish geography, but what does he ask him? What's your name? Your name. Your name. Of all things that we Yaakov needs to know. What's your name? Odd question. And then the odd answer is, it's, it's, it's even funnier, right? Lama ze tishalishmi? Like, what, what, why are you asking for my name? Fine. In other words, if, if Yaakov was curious, okay. If the fellow was a jerk and they want to give his name, also okay. But that the Torah needs to record this. The Torah needs to record that Yaakov Avinu was not answered. What's going on there? So this is question number two that you're going to have to uh, keep in mind. Now, number three, okay? Number three. Uh, you know, what, what do people do in yeshivot? This is a question... <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I just to know ah, too. <laughs> thank you. I deserve that. <laughs> okay, so when you study in a yeshiva, this would be interesting, by the way, to know. But let's break down. In other words, any any uh, you want to go ahead and study law the Department of Philosophy, right? So you want to know what the lectures are about, right? What do they focus on? Uh, what are they doing? You want to understand the school of business. It also makes sense to know what's the majority. What are they talking about? Investments? Are they talking about uh, the corruption in, in government? What are they talking about? So now it's time to analyze a little bit about yeshivot. Okay. So, and when I talk about yeshivot, we're talking about, let's say, post high school, uh, where some students, some students are, are only learning limude uh, kodesh. Right? Talmud, rabbinic texts. So first of all, not everyone is learning all time. That's number one. In other words, there is a percentage that they're there, but they're wasting some time. No different than any um, office, by the way. Right? I mean, it, I, really, right? You go to the workplace. Is everyone really working um, the full time? Or are people looking at their phones? So there are those that are really working all time. And there's those not. And the issue is exactly the same. There are those who are studying every minute possible, and there are those that are studying at time and they're schmoozing a little bit of politics, right? They don't have sports, so they have elections in Israel instead, right? We have a Super Bowl once a year, they have elections four times a year, it's different. <laughs> but there are things that you could talk about, fine. But then the one, we're focusing on the ones that actually study. What are they studying? So there's a, a minority, believe it or not, it's a minority that focus on getting smicha meaning studying those things that are practical halacha. It's a minority. Uh, there, are, there are those that, that, within the minority that focus on understanding how to paskin. And the way it's done is that there are three <coughs> core sections of Shulchan Aruch that they're still supposed to study in great depth. One of them is the laws of mixing milk and meat. The other one is known as ta'aruvot, which means if, let's say, some non-kosher substance gets mixed in, is it nullified or not? And the third one has to do with salting chickens and meat, which is not done anymore, meaning most people don't do it at home, but nevertheless it became part of the norm. Once they master how to study that, they really could apply that way of learning into all areas of halakha. Okay, so even though it's a smaller section than Shulchan Aruch, right? It's, it's, you know, Shulchan Aruch has, you know, uh, you know hundreds of hundreds of uh, chapters. And this is one section, but it trains them how. Right? My oldest now, uh, my Uzi Baruch Hashem, just, he's going through these three tests for, for Smicha. And he just finished his second one, the most, the, the, the most significant one. So he's, you know, he's working on it. It's not that he, I won't let him become a rabbi, but at the same time, <laughs> it's nice that he's a Torah scholar. That's important for me that he studies and he's involved, and then he does something else to feed his Bezra Hashem, his family. Now, 
What about the rest of the learners that are not studying halacha? What do they do? So you'll say they study Talmud. Fine, they study Talmud. Within the study of Talmud, there is a very popular way of relating to the text, and that is, in two words, it's known as a diuk barambam. Diuk barambam. What does that mean? And this is extremely popular, especially over the past 140 years. And that is that you take the works of Maimonides in his codes, and if he adds an extra word, or if he leaves out something that's mentioned in the Talmud, or if he goes ahead and determines something based on a minority opinion, you try to understand why did Maimonides do so? And you go back to the Talmudic text to try to figure out how Rambam read it, and you have to have some creativity. Some people are indeed creative and come up with magnificent insights, others less, but that's a style of learning. Some call it a brisker learning because it goes back to Reb Chaim Brisker in the 1880s, who taught it in Volozhin. Fine. So what we're going to do now with that introduction is study a Rambam, and we're going to do our own diyuk in the Rambam. Are you ready for it? Maimonides tells us that you should know, when you open a Chumash, we are told not to marry into the seven nations that settled in the land of Israel. Remember them? And Mori Prezid, Yergashi, remember them? So keep away from them. No shidduch with them, even if they convert. They're people that you just simply keep away. But the Rambam tells us, don't get too worried. Don't get too worried about the fact that we accept and have welcomed and treated converts as halacha requires with the most respect and dignity. But when it comes to those seven nations, don't concern yourself because kvar avad zichram. Kvar avad zichram. They're gone. We don't know who they are. They, they left to other areas, so they're no, it's no longer relevant. Right after that, the Rambam tells us that there is a mitzvah, le'abed zecher amalek. Tells us that we have this interesting mitzvah of uprooting the memory of Amalek. And also we don't marry into them. We, don't, we keep away from Amalek. And he doesn't add those three words, kvar, avad, zichram. In other words, it appears to be that Maimonides is telling us, even though the nations of 3,000, 4,000 years ago have intermingled with other nations and no, have not retained their identity Amalek has. Which is interesting, right? which is difficult to understand. So how do we deal with this? So that's going to be our next question. The last question, when this Shabbat we come to Shul and you fulfill what is known as a Torah law to remember this mitzvah of uprooting the memory of Amalek, which obviously needs clarity. So we're going to read from a section in the book of Devarim, and it notes there that you should know Amalek that attacked you are bad people. Velo yare Elohim. Did not have the fear of God. Fear of God. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting, right? You're dealing here with people Right? They want to destroy you, they want to kill you, they have no mercy. And the only thing you could say about him is, you know, felt in his yiras shamayim, he's lacking, in other words, that term of lacking fear of God. Perhaps if you're interacting with another Jew, right, then you feel that he wasn't completely honest, you could give him that title. He was lacking a little bit of fear of God. To apply it to a society that's on the bottom of the barrel due to their behavior, the lo yare alokim, that needs clarity as well. So here we have to deal with these issues and see how many of them we could put together. So number one, this whole idea of uprooting a nation, is it, it's not, we, a sensitive Jew should have a level of difficulty, right? If you read in Tanakh, right, of uprooting nations, and you think as a modern being that if a person is living as a, de as a decent being, how can I uproot him due to the fact that he's a descendant of a specific individual? That's very un-Jewish, it's very un-Jewish. So how do we deal with this uprooting the memory of our Malek? And a better question is, this Shabbat, or if you come Purim and you hear the Torah reading, where you could fulfill the obligation of hearing that section also if you come on Purim. So what mitzvah are you fulfilling? Uprooting the memory of Amalek. What on earth does that mean? It makes no sense, right? Uprooting a memory, but you're supposed to remember it. If you uprooted it last year, I'm not going to remember it this year, right? If I forget things, you forget things. 
if it's killing, I'm not planning to kill anyone. It's not my, I'm not into that stuff. So what is this yes about? So two great luminaries of the 19th century are going to make it very clear to us. One of them was Rav Hirsch in Germany, and the other one was the head of the Voloz in Yeshiva in Poland, and they made the Nitziv, that you should know what we must do as we read this section is remember that when it comes to Amalek, they had a philosophy. They had a philosophy. They had a way of thinking. That way of thinking is one that is the most un-Jewish way of thinking. That is what you have to uproot. Okay? So I'll quote Rav Hirsch. Timched zecher Amalek, lo Amalek. For gen future generations, there is no mitzvah. There is no mitzvah to go out and kill an Amalek. That's not what it's about, says Rav Hirsch. But rather, zichro v'tehilato, that which he viewed as as a good attribute, something we should be proud of, a philosophy that they carried on a banner with great pride, get rid of that. That's what Rav Hirsch says. Netziv, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the head of the Valoz in Yeshiva, the father of modern day Yeshivot says, you should know, it's Te'udat Amalek Be'olam, that which they carried as their philosophy, as their principles, as what existence is about. That is what you try to get rid of. Now, with that, my father said the following. When Yaakov Avinu asks this force that's fighting him, your name, you know what he's asking him? What nation in the future do my children have to worry from? In other words, I know, I understand now that for future generations, unfortunately, the carriers of those who believe in a revelation, those who believe that there's a God, those that believe that there's a spirit of God in every single human being, right? Those that believe that there's purpose in existence, those that believe that things are not random, are going to be fought by a nation. Who are they? Who should I be careful from? What's your name? The angel responds, Lama Zetisha, don't ask me my name. You know what he's really saying? A name is an identity. In other words, if there would have been a name presented to Yaakov, it would have meant that Amalek is one nation. Amalek is not one nation. Amalek is anyone who buys in to the principles and the ways of thinking of Amalek. If you think like an Amalek, if you think that everything is random, and you think that there's a race that is the higher and greater race, and all other ones are considered less human, and if you believe that if the less human are disturbing you, you should get rid of those less human, if you think that those who are weak have no place in a society because society is supposed to build itself as one of strength, that's Amalek. I don't have a name because anyone, just as you could convert to Judaism and you are 100% a Jew, you could unfortunately convert to the Amalek philosophy. And therefore, based on that, my father, you understand that the Rambam, when it comes to nations that 3,400 years ago were problematic, you don't worry about them because they're gone. If you're looking for a nation, a race, that's irrelevant. If you're looking at a philosophy, Rambam tells us Amalek is still relevant. Okay? Amalek is still relevant. You know, when, when any young student studies Tractate Megillah in the Talmud, there's a, there's a paragraph that is striking. There's a paragraph that's quite striking. Because there's a statement there shared by Rav Yitzchak, who wrote this some 1,700 years ago. And Rav Yitzchak, uh, in, in Talmudic style, re reads a verse that Yaakov Avinu said, this is in Tehilim, and reads into it what the real prayer of Yaakov was. And Rabbi Yitzchak tells us the following, that Yaakov Avinu turned to the Almighty and he said to him, listen, there are descendants of Esav that are extremely dangerous. Because if you remove the muzzle, this is in the Talmud, if you remove the zamemo, the, the muzzle, and do not constrain them, they could destroy the world. The Talmud says, you want to know who this refers to? What, what descendant of Esav it's referring to? That they could destroy the world if not for the prayer of Yaakov. So the Talmud says, Germam Yashel Edom. This is in the printed edition of the Talmud. 
So comes the Vilna God and the Talmud, by the way, Talmud ends off, She'ilmaleh, if not for the prayer of Yaakov, Yotzin and Machrevin kol ha'olam kulo, they would go forth and destroy the world. So it's always striking when you read it in, in the Talmud, right? It's been around, it's been in manuscripts for 1,700 years, and you read about a Germamia, and the Vilna God tells us, by the way, it's not exactly Germamia, the Vilna God tells us. What does he tell us? Germania. Yeah. You know, and when, when this idea, you have to realize that, in, you know, in many modern world, <coughs> where I came from and tells, that when you say something in the name of the Vilna Gon, it places it on the highest uh, level of authority. Remember, I remember the head of the yeshiva telling us that we have, that the way we work in our yeshiva, that when it comes to our philosophy, he mentions the names, that we got it from uh, Rabbi Lemir Bloch, who got it from uh, Rabbi Yosef Leibach, who got it from Laser Gordon, and he would mention all the names until the Vilna Gaon, and he says, and we, know, we have no need to go further back once you have the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon has this significance, and as a result of this reading, there was even uh, an approach that existed by some of his, stu by some of his students that we view the Germans, and we're talking about the Germans in the early 19th century, before there was a German country of Germany, as Amalek. To such an extent, an interesting question, there was a <coughs> rabbi of Bnei Brak. He was the rabbi of Bnei Brak for over 50 years. His name was Rav Wozner. Rav Wozner, you know, you heard the name, Rav Wozner. And Rav Wozner was asked to Shaiva. Rav Wozner was asked that there's a young individual who is not Jewish, very fine, uh, magnificent behavior and attributes, intellectual, he's studying Torah, has an understanding of Torah, complete commitment. They're ready to convert him, but there was one problem. He's German. He's German. So they come to Reb Wozner and they ask him a shaila. In other words, that we have a tradition of the, ga of the gra, can we convert him? Now, it's in, the, the answer is, by the way, the answer is 100% you convert him. In other words, we're not going to take a tradition of the Gra to change a reality. In other words, a need in his words, I don't see a problem. Because in Baim Bemet Lachsotat Kanfea Shina, no question in his mind. Right? Uh, but the idea that the question is even asked, it tells us that we have linked Germany to an Amalek philosophy. There's no question in anyone's mind here. They bought into the philosophy. If they are actual descendants or not, I think that's irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Their behavior is 100% Amalek. Read anything or listen to parents, or you know, this is something that we don't forget. Right? We don't forget. It's interesting that when you drive on the 401, and you drive from the airport east, mm -hmm. and there's a sign there that I think is always absurd because it says the following, that it's something like Veterans Memorial Highway. Yeah. We don't forget for the next 172 kilometers. And after that, <laughs> that way, like, I don't know, it just bothers me. Like, what do you mean? I, you should, so we don't, we don't forget. We don't, yeah. we, we don't forget. In other words, there's no such thing, you know, when they talk about 75 years of liberation, Yom HaShoah, there's not a day that a, that a decent Jew doesn't forget. That's, that's what, how, how we live. We don't forget. But this is an interesting thing. Now, there's what, one of the most magnificent, magnificent statements that the rabbis make is the following that they had a tradition that Haman descendants, some of them, converted to Judaism. Yeah. You know that? Mm -hmm. Just to tell you, the rabbis want to make it clear. Don't make it racial. This is what the rabbis are telling us. Mm -hmm. If you have a person, and people here, like there, you know, I mentioned, Josh mentioned, maybe also you did, that there was the descendants of, uh, of Hess, of, of, of the biggest Nazis, yeah. Yeah. who walked away. Eichmann's uh, son, his youngest son, not his older ones are people that are disgusted and, and are fighting it day in, day out. And as Jews, what we have to say to them is, you are 100% kosher for us. Why? We don't make it racial. We're not like your parent. In other words, we're not like the Nazis. We don't make it racial. And therefore, mi bnei banav shel haman, shaya mizera amalek, limdu Torah be bnei brak in all places. In other words, their intensity. They use that intensity for some incredible things for the teaching of Torah. We are not going to make anything that's racial. So I think that, that addresses a little bit of the questions, a few of the questions that we, that we talked about. But what really, what really is the, the philosophy of Amalek? What's what, Germany? Germany and Amalek. You've heard of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche? 
Yeah. God is dead. Now he's known for God is dead, but there's 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 more there's more now. He was uh, a German philosopher in the 19th century, died in the year 1900. His brain, his his mind died earlier, but uh, Nietzsche is was you known when you study existentialism, you'll focus a lot on Nietzsche. And although he's quoted as God is as dead, what you could say really is he the you could also uh, put his philosophy in one word, and that's the Ubermensch. Thus spoke Zarathustra. In other words, that you go ahead, and he, he he's critical of Christianity. Why is he critical of Christianity? Because Christianity talks about you know concern you know due to the fact that you believe in a higher force, so you do not maximize your being because you rely on salvation, right? So you don't live to the fullest. But now that the, the modern world, that the Enlightenment has killed God, and thus God is dead, so therefore man has to make himself in to the best he could be. And therefore, when there's a slave mentality that you go ahead and you have mercy, mercy is, 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 is a terrible thing. And you know, when and he writes, the, the sick, he writes, are the great, danger of man, not the evil, not the beast of prey, when a person is weak and is not fulfilling his full potential and is not turning into that ubermensch, into that superman, that is something that society has to worry about. Now, Nietzsche himself was not an anti-Semite, was not an anti-Semite, okay, it's not. What happened was, is that Nietzsche had a, a, a sister that took care of him in his last years when he lost his mind. And she, the Nazis, plugged into his philosophy, plugged into the idea and the idea that there is an the Aryan race that's greater than all other races, that there's an uber race that is based on Nietzsche. So he himself was not one who would believe in it, but his sister did promote it. The sister supposedly had financial issues, and she was able to capitalize uh, you know, through her brother's writings, who became uh, a celebrity. And uh, Hitler, of course, was a big fan of the sister. Hitler went to her funeral in 1935. But you see here the roots. The roots of a good society is one that cuts out those who cannot reach full potential. In other words, you get rid of a higher being, right? Look at man and only man. Everything uh, thus is random. If everything is random, just as there is natural selection within nature, and what species survive the fittest, so too it comes with us humans, that the stronger species should be the ones to survive to build a better world. And the species <coughs> or the, the, the races that pull us down, or in a society itself, if you have those who are sick, who are ill, who are dealing with, uh, that are handicapped due to a mental state, whatever, they have no place in a society. That's Nazism, and that's Amalek. That's a Molek. Asher, Karcha, Badera. Who did they go after? They went after the weak. The weak. Now, there's an incredible reading by some. When you see in the Torah the words, a lack of fear of God, velo yare elokim, a lack of fear of God, what we're being told is that if there's a lack of fear of God, if there's no recognition that there's a higher being, you're going to do what you want. You're going to go ahead and push aside those cannot be protected. And it's interesting to note, for example, that uh, Avimel, uh, Avram Avinu was very concerned when he was around, among the Philistines. And he turns to Avimelech and he says, listen, I couldn't be honest here because I'm weak, I'm a foreigner, no one's going to defend me. I had to lie. Because what's lacking here, in other words, why in, in, in this region are the weak not protected? Why is it that the outsider who has no one to support is unsafe? Because in Yirat Elokim Bamakomazet. In other words, what is that which causes a society to push aside the weak, to not be concerned about those who can't defend themselves? A lack of fear of God. When you fear God, you know that there's a divine spirit in every being. Right? And so too. When Yosef, remember Yosef gathered his brothers and put them into jail before they knew who he is, when he was prime minister, and they didn't know that they're dealing here with their brother. And he turns to them and he says, eventually, you know what? 
I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you free. Because, et elokim, I fear God. In other words, you are weak. You have no one defending you. Right? I could easily crush you and destroy you. But, there's a God. A fear of God means, you know what a fear of God is? When you take care of the needs of those who are weak. You know, and so too, when the Mialdot, right, when it comes to the midwives in Egypt, the midwives in Egypt, right, you had there the, they could have easily done what Pharaoh says to get rid of the babies, mm -hmm. but what, what do they have? The weak, the weakest being, right, a child born, right? Vatirena hamialdot et, that fear of God, that's what fear of God is. Amalek, Amalek is lacking it. So if there are weak individuals in a society that can't defend themselves, what do you do? You just get rid of them. That's Amalek. And that's what we focus on getting rid of. Right? That is what we do. And that's what this season really is about. This season is all about thinking of those who need that boost. Right? Thinking of those who close door. Thinking of those. You know, it's... Purim the, 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 it was very exciting when you were when you were uh, very young when you were a kid. It's very. Not, I'm not saying it's not exciting now, but you can't compare. In other words, for the 11 year old girl, you know, to go ahead and ready eight weeks in advance, start thinking of what to make in the shalach manas and how to decorate the cupcake and if, how to how to package the frosting. I mean, you can go with sugar from especially when it's the only one at home and is in charge of two parents who stand there, yes, whatever you want. Right? So it, it, it's, an, it, it's a very, very exciting time. Now, for the, for the yeshiva boy, for the yeshiva boy, uh, what's exciting about Purim? I don't know if you want to know. Yeah, the drink, the drink, right? In other words, you try to control it when they're 14, forget it when they're 15, and hopefully by the time they reach uh, 18 already, they had enough and like uh, they, they matured. That's what you hope. Right? <laughs> so, then now the, there are those, by the way, you know what they say, that t t in this day and age, teenagehood continues into the late 30s. <laughs> and there are, unfortunately, those that still uh, have this deep emotional connection to the bottle that on Purim exists. So there's a thing, you know, you know, you could drink and have a good time and have a good time. That's very un Purim dick, by the way. In other words, if drinking is just for the sake of having that good feeling, that's an awful problem. It's, 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 you know, the halal, it's, it's a challenge that exists because in Shulchan Aruch we're told a person is supposed to have initially besume. So this is a problem because throughout Jewish education, you tell people, be a good Jew. Follow that which is written in Shulchan Aruch. And then come Purim and you say, well, that don't. It's a problem a little bit. So in my yeshiva and tells, Rabbi Levin Zatzal would get up before Purim and he would say, you don't have to drink, right? And if you worry that after 120 you're going to come up in heaven and they're going to say to you, why did you fulfill what it says in Shulchan Aruch to drink? It's on me. The Rosh would say, I'll take your sins. I'm going to take it. He was very, very confident that it's not exactly a requirement to go ahead and act like a... Not. So one of the authorities, one of the great authorities that uh, addresses this and is probably the one that everyone should tune into, especially those who never tune in to messages from older people, was a rabbi, uh, author of the Kolbo, lived in the 14th century, early 14th century, and he says the following, that even though we read Chayav Adam Lebesumi Ampurim, which means, which has been translated as getting drunk, he says, no, lo Are you out of your mind? doesn't mean getting drunk. Shashikrut, getting drunk, he writes, isur gamur. It's a prohibition. En lecha avera gdola mizur. It's the greatest violation of Jewish law. You know, this should be publicized on billboards in every Jewish city. En lecha avera gdola mizur. Who is this? Who says this? Kolbo. Orchos Chaim slash Kolbo, quoted by the tour quoted by Rabbi Yosef Karo, I mean, and this is uh, halacha. So this is the real thing. It's a violation. Becoming drunk is a violation of law. And he writes, Shigorem arugilu yarayot shfichu damim kava kama averot. Okay, so this is the real, the real Judaism. You know, there's the popular Judaism, which is fun, but then there's the real Judaism. Avera gdola. So what is it yes about? So he says the following. Sheishteh, 
יותר מלימודו מעט. But hopefully on a Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. you're not drinking at all. I sure hope so. Okay? <laughs> so therefore, on Purim next week, 4 p.m. in the afternoon, drink a touch more than usual. Which means you take one shot, shot glass and fill a tenth of it with wine. Okay? And drink that. You have fulfilled the mitzvah because you're drinking more than you usually drink. And again, every person knows that what, what, what their limits are, they, at least they should be. But what's the purpose? So here's the key. Here's the key. Ki yedei, the purpose is not for you to feel good. Shiarbe lismoach velesameach evyonim. You know how it is. That some people have a personality, they're a little bit uptight. And after a little drink, they're less uptight. I can tell you, shul here upstairs, Shabbos that there are people that I interact with before Kiddush and after Kiddush. <laughs> 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 person, right? There are persons that come over to me before the L'chaim, and they're like, the Shabbos, Rabbi. And after the L'chaim, they're all excited. It's two different people, right? What's the purpose of having that little drink? Because then you could be welcoming to others. And then you have the ability, in his words, l'sameach evyonim, that if you interact with those who are going through some difficulty, before the little Achaim, you know, you're, you're controlled. Afterwards, you can give them words of encouragement. You can bring happiness to them. Ve'inachem otam. Those who need an uplifting word, if you use your Lachaim to go ahead and give them that boost, v'idaber alim alibam, v'zotis ha'simcha ha'shlema, he says. You want to know what happiness of Purim is? To think about the other. Matanot levyonim, the other. Mishlach manot, the other. The drinking is the other. That's Purim, and that's how we fight Amalek. How do you fight a philosophy that believes that the weak needs need to, be, need to be cut out? Look at the Jewish way of dealing with it. And, you know, and in the state of Israel, by the way, there's so much focus on dealing with, with the situations of those who have disabilities, right? You see it everywhere. There's a sensitivity because you're building a society with an understanding, we are not Amalek, we're Klal Israel. We're very, very different. We welcome everyone. Everyone is welcome. And by the way, this is how you can understand the end of Parashat Tetzaveh. Do you know that the golden altar, the golden altar, they, among the spices that were burnt was something called Chelbana, which according to the rabbis had an awful aroma. But you would mix it in with the other blends, with the other blends, and it would create a pleasant aroma. The rabbis had a tradition that what you would do is you would take 10 spices and add the 11th spice, the galbanum, the chalbana, and that creates the perfect aroma. 10 always symbolizes a minyan, right, a complete society. But we welcome always even the 11th person that has whatever, it is, whatever issue it is. We are welcoming. And that's Aharon Akon, by the way. Ohev shalom, rodev shalom, ohev etabriot, mekarvan la Torah. Aaron Akon is the one that guides us, that welcomes and can interact with any person and sees the good in every person and sees the divine spirit in every person. That's why this is the Parsha of Aharon and this is the Parsha that we fight Amalek because we are fighting an attitude that exists and the hatred towards the people of Israel is really a hatred towards what we symbolize. That's, that's the message and with that hopefully we have a magnificent Purim. It should be a Purim Sameach, a meaningful one. Thank you everyone for coming. It's the end of the season technically, so grace is to those. And we'll be in touch about a class in two weeks, but I don't know yet. But next week, no class. Have a good day. How's my sister doing? I talked to her. Sandra, but she doesn't hear well on the